Hey there, my name's Rod Yates. Welcome to Mastering Events, an Audience Republic podcast. Each episode, I'll be talking to some of the world's most accomplished event professionals to discover how they got where they are today, the lessons they've learned throughout that journey, and their insights around event marketing and maximizing ticket sales. My guest today is Steve Levy, CEO of Clanger Digital and Chief Marketing Officer and Chief Revenue Officer for Imagine Music Festival. It's difficult to sum up the depth and breadth of Steve's career, but here are a few dot points. In the late 80s, Steve was one of the pioneers of the underground rave scene in LA, promoting shows and holding raves in abandoned warehouses, all the while evading the reach of the local police. He went on to co-found Moonshine Music in 1992, the label that effectively introduced electronic music to mainstream America and later launched Moonshine Over America, at that point the only annual national electronic music tour. In the years since, he's occupied roles such as Head of Marketing and Digital at Insomniac Events, Chief Marketing Officer at Virgin Fests, North American General Manager at Fest Ticket, and that's just for starters. Born in the UK, he moved to LA in high school and began promoting shows several years later, which is where we pick up the conversation. Promoting shows started actually when, when I was in university. I was at a school called Pepperdine, which is in Malibu. Um, yeah, rough life. Um, <laughs> there was um, a bar in Malibu called Trancas Bar and Grill, which had shut down and then was reopened by a guy who, was at, who, who had acquired it mid-80s. Um, at the same time as when another bar that was like the the Thursday night bar for all of the Pepperdine kids to go to shut down. And my brother and, and a good friend of mine, George Seferis, we had this bright idea of renting out Trancas Bar and Grill on a Thursday night to do a, a night for the Pepperdine kids. And uh, that took off. We did that for a couple of years. And then we started promoting a, a Saturday night once a month at another place. Um, called the Malibu Bar and Grill, uh, which is now where Soho House and Nobu is in Malibu. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of our club promoting. It started out, um, I think the first night we did the Trankers thing, I had these big plans of DJing and um, didn't really pull it off and just happened to be a local local guy in the bar at the time who was a DJ named Moon Pop. And uh, we enlisted him to take over and... Uh, for our, our nights in Malibu, he was one of our leading guys. That was the start of it. I then, I went back to the UK summer of 88 when I graduated school, and that was obviously the infamous summer of love. I was kind of hanging out London, West London. I was going to stuff like Crazy Larry's, which was one of, mm-hmm. one of the first kind of club nights focused on Acid House, also Spectrum, which was Paul Oakenfold's uh, night. Um, and then, you know, ending up at probably a few warehouse parties and stuff like that. So got sick of the weather in the UK, probably about six months after I was back there in the middle of December. My brother was still out here in at school and I came back here with a stack of records. He was promoting a new night with our other, our other partner, George, in Santa Monica, which was kind of going into town from Malibu uh, at an Irish bar called Ned Kelly's. And uh, it was called West Go West was the night. And I started DJing the Acid House music along with a guy named Mark Lewis, who was um, had grown up with Carl Cox and, and Paul Oakenfold. Mark was at, had just moved to, the, to LA at the time. And uh, we kind of got a name for being one of the first spots to be playing that music. Do you then graduate to the warehouses, putting on warehouse yeah. parties? Is that the next yeah. step? Yeah, so the so the next step was there was a bartender at Ned Kelly's and she used to uh, bartend for a guy who owned a sports bar, but he also owned this venue that he ran a, a pretty infamous illegal casino in in LA at the time in on the west side of LA, and he'd had to shut down the casino for obvious reasons, but he was kind of up for renting out this venue it was a, it was now being used as a, a as a rehearsal studio to us and we did the first moonshine warehouse party there that was the first um first of our undergrounds and we promoted it kind of around town with you know hand to hand flyering with just a uh, hand drawn moonshine jug with two x's on it and a friday night midnight and a phone number and uh right. 
that's how we started it. And myself and Mark Lewis DJ there and, and, um, it kicked off. Um, and we ran moonshine at various locations. We I think we ran it for about 14 times before we actually got busted. Um, <laughs> I saw, you know, you, we managed to stay out of jail. Um, and you know, we got a pretty good <laughs> reputation from it. Um, it was great. It was on a Friday, started at midnight, went till seven o'clock in the morning. You paid money to come in and, uh, you had kind of, there was a, there was a red punch and cheap beer that was free. And, uh, at the peak, probably about a thousand people showed up for it on a, on a wow. Friday. Um, wow. it was a good time. What was the, what did the red punch consist of? It consisted of the cheapest possible vodka we could find, um, <laughs> a fruit punch mix from, you know, like the local cash and carry and the water that came out of the hose in whatever warehouse that we were at, along with some ice <laughs> and right. in a trash can with a trash bag. So I didn't drink it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so how, did, how did you, you mentioned it, you didn't end up in jail, but how did you avoid the police? Yeah, that's that's um, an interesting question. We had been inspired to do Moonshine by a, a, a night that was happening in Hollywood called Palooka Joe's that was run by this kind of guy, this guy Solomon Mansour, who was a kind of after hours legend, um, also another English guy who had been in London during the early 80s and had promoted the WAG Club and was kind of around the whole Depeche Mode culture club scene. He started you know the the kind of traveling clubs scene in the mid 80s in LA he was a big part of it and and he did a a night called Palooka Joe's at the Hollywood Athletic Club and we we kind of went in there one night promoting handing flyers out and like showed up and Solly was like you know it's 20 bucks I don't care who you are and and we <laughs> ended up befriending him and when we started he got busted uh, by Hollywood Vice, but he had a guy, um, he kind of took us under his wing and introduced us to, to a, a character by the name of Irish Richie, who was, um, <laughs> let's just say he was kind of on the run, but um, <laughs> his, he ended up in LA. His girlfriend was uh, the personal assistant to Althea Flint, who was Larry Flint's wife. Right. Um, and through that, he used to work security with some vice guys on, on the Hustler porn shoots, which at the time were illegal. And they used to employ off-duty vice cops to secure the shoots. And Richie kind of introduced us to these guys. We paid some money. We asked no questions. And for... <laughs> Probably, you know, six, eight months, we never got shut down. And whenever the cops would show up, the vice cops would have a word with them and they would go away. A um, couple of times we had local gangs show up and the guys, we, we had one episode where the, the vice cops opened up the trunk of their car and there were some tactical weapons in the trunk. And uh, they said, look, you are messing with the biggest gang in L.A. We suggest you leave. So and they did. <laughs> Do you miss the the spirit of those days? That sounds like a pretty uh, no. wild time. No, I mean, look, I was you know twenty one ish, and and sure. uh, it, it was interesting. I mean, I remember my brother got told he he used to collect the money at the door, and one time I, Irish Richie says to him, you know, John, you need to get in the back of this LAPD cop car over here, and you need to hand him an envelope. And my brother actually handed an envelope with 300 bucks in cash to on-duty LAPD to go away. Oh. And they did. <laughs> so, and that was the point where he was out. He was like, I'm out. I've got a college degree. I don't need this shit. I'm going back to England. And he took off. Yeah, right. Okay. But then, I mean, Moonshine just evolved, didn't it? You had the Moonshine music label, which I believe started in 1992. And I think in 1997, you did the, what is it, the, the Moonshine over America. You started that annual tour, which I guess was probably forging new ground, was it, for, for electronic music at that time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, that's a very quick fast forward. Um, it is. <laughs> I you know, got the opportunity to get into the, the music business. I kind of got to a point with promoting 
clubs and club nights where I was like, you know, I, I don't think I want to do this for the rest of my life. And it wasn't because of the um, craziness that was kind of going on around Moonshine. We I actually had a very successful club night called Truth, which ran for a couple of years and was, you know, doing 2000 people every other Saturday night and was kind of a a real linchpin for electronic music, dance music in LA. And in, in fact, in the country, because a lot of the people that either came through there or worked with me ended up kind of moving around the country. And, and I use this as a segue because what happened was I started the label, the label became very successful very quickly. And that was from like 92 through to like 96, 97. And we were at the front of pushing DJs as artists and in their own right. And we, we kind of pioneered the DJ mix album. Um, and one of the frustrations was that we weren't, you know, we didn't have like a, a circuit for these guys to play around the country. And I was working with a guy named Paul Morris who had a, a new agency called AM Only, which ended up becoming para, becoming part of Paradigm much later on. And um, Paul was another expat, a guy who I'd met through um, another guy I worked with in, in the music business, Richard Russell, who ran XL Recordings. Paul was was running like a small booking agency out of the back room of he had a, a, a store called Breakbeat Science, which was a, a, a record store that sold Jungle and Breakbeat in the East Village in New York. Um, I went to him out of frustration because I was like trying to figure out like, how do we book some of our DJs as a package? And he's like, you know, I got a little circuit. And then it turned out that there was a circuit of promoters around the country, including some guys that had come from Truth and stuff like that, that we put together. And in 97, we did 14 shows. We flew it. We rotated about eight of the Moonshine artists on it, but we we gave it kind of unified branding, Moonshine Over America, 97. And mm -hmm. um, we went out and did it, and it was it worked. It, it, you know, what we used, we used it as kind of an anchor for some retail marketing for the records that we were shipping to stores. And... The next year, the circuit grew. The success of, of, of what we did because it was Moonshine kind of spread to more promoters. And um, we ended up doing it through 2001. I think it was five, four, five years. And it grew mm. to like 30 dates on a rock and roll tour bus. We had some shows in, in, you know, in some secondary markets where we had 25,000 people showing up. And wow. um it was a great success. It really, it really was. I would argue we pioneered that circuit of promoters that even today, some of those guys are still some of the top guys in electronic music. Guys like Donnie, Disco Donnie, he, you know, who's a dear friend. He was mm. one of the first promoters we worked with in New, out of New Orleans. He, he was there. The guys from Made Events, um, who, you know, were behind EZU, um, Chicago, Detroit guys you know guys who are still promoting in those markets um even dallas are still around i mean it must have been presumably quite a big learning curve were, were there lessons that you learned back then uh, around about marketing or promoting or even just building audience loyalty that actually still ring true today yeah i mean with moonshine with the record label we were we were very early on to tap into kind of the promise and the power of the internet um, we were one of the first record labels to actually have a website. And, and then we kind of embraced email and email marketing. We were kind of at the front of getting on, on you know, the very, at the time there were a lot of groups online, like chat groups, like out.raves and stuff like that. Um, and we, you know, we, we got a hold of it. We also were very aggressive with um, kind of owning the zines from, from an advertising standpoint. We, we took over all of the back covers and we, we were fortunate. The other end of the business that we did was that we spent a lot of money on retail marketing. So end cap positioning. And we were, you know, probably the point of entry for electronic music and dance music for people in secondary and th tertiary markets around the whole country. You know, if you were into dance music in the 90s, you bought one of our albums at one point. But so we were making it up as we went along. So, <laughs> Right. So were there, were there uh, mistakes that you made that, were, that actually became big learning lessons? 
if there were, I've forgotten them. I, I would say probably most of our mistakes were more on you just overall strategy of what we were doing as a business. My brother and I were business partners in it. We were young guys. We were experiencing kind of like, you know, 30 to 50% year over year growth um, mm. from the start. You know, I think the mistake that we we probably made was we thought it was going to last forever. And then, as you know, there was a point in time when the kids stopped paying for the shiny silver discs and the music business in, you know, globally imploded. And um, I think an older, wiser guy as I am today probably would have seen it coming and or at least kind of battened down a hatch or two at some point. And how did you weather that storm? Uh, really badly. I mean, you know, we as a, as a record label, I mean, I, you know, I told the story and I, I kind of say briefly, like everyone thinks that the music business, at least in the US, collapsed because of downloads, because of piracy because CDRs and all that kind of stuff. And I would argue that that's not true. It was actually 9-11 mm -hmm. that really caused it because it, it was the trigger for a collapse in retail, not just in music retail, but in overall retail in America. And the you, September 11th was the beginning of, you know, Q, the end of Q3, beginning of Q4, when you sell most of your product, whatever retail business you're in. The northeast of America is the biggest part of the market. That shut down post 9-11. There were bomb scares. There were malls being evacuated. There was just overall kind of lack of consumer confidence. And the knock-on effect was that was, you know, a couple of years later, a lot of, of retail chains, not just in music, went bankrupt. Um, mm. Where the music business was particularly affected was that music sales, record sales were sale and return. When some of the major chains went into bankruptcy, they were bought out of bankruptcy by hedge funds and private equity because they knew that all of that inventory sitting on their shelves could be sent back to the record labels or the distributors that sold them. So to kind of two years later, we suddenly were getting big chunks of product back to us and we, you know, it killed our cash flow. And we were, you know, at the time at our peak, we were like 0.12% of, of US record market as a label. Um, wow. And it took us out. So you can imagine how it worked for the major labels. So we didn't do well. We wound the business down, but we, you know, we then diversified and moved into, uh, we, we acquired a magazine BPM and then we built a publishing and then what became a, a marketing business. And in, in that business, we had a pretty big, event business uh bpm we used to do like 60 events a year um, through mm. that business i was guilty of skipping forward quite a long way earlier in this interview and, and i'd like to commit that crime once again and actually skip forward to 2017 when um you're the head of marketing and, and digital at insomniac events yes and one of your key achievements there was selling out edc las vegas in 2020 which for i understand which for the first time if you can think back to them, like what were some of the key uh, cornerstones of the marketing that you got right to achieve that result? Well, the big one was having a plan. I went into Insomniac um, when they were in kind of a, a time of, of flux and turnaround. They had kind of brought in some new man new guys at upper management. They had gone in and um, let go about 40 people. And I was kind of brought in as an adult in the room to help restructure the business and kind of sat in there for a couple of months uh, making a bunch of young guys very nervous and um, <laughs> and then kind of figured out who was doing what and, and in my opinion the first thing which I, I, I felt that they you know they weren't doing at the time was treating selling tickets as an e-commerce business and using best practices from e-com that were, you know, in 2017, very well established. And they weren't really kind of tapping into that. At the time, the, 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 the team that was heading up marketing, a lot of them had come out of the ad agency business and were kind of very heavy on media buying. It was a time when, you know, you could put $20 into Facebook and get $100 out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my, my hiring process at Insomniac was was a pretty long one and I had spent some time with department heads 
kind of figuring out where, you know, what was going right, what was going wrong. And one of the things that I realized prior to going in, right before I went in, was that they were not relying on their email list and hadn't built, had let their email list go away. And I remember it was funny because I went, I was having a back and forth with Pasquale over several months and eventually came around to me and he said, you know, I don't know, what, I don't think we have a role for you. And I was kind of, at the time, you know, Clanger Digital is my consultancy. And, you know, I, I was a consultant for, you know, several, many businesses. And mm. as a consultant, my part of my job is to get business was to put proposals together. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to put a proposal together because, you know, he's wrong. And I yeah. put a proposal together and, and um, it got in front of Pasquale and it got in front of the two guys who, who were, you know, being brought in to, to rebuild the business or at least restructure the business and immediately they called me in for a, a final interview or what ended up being a final interview and in that I mapped out a plan where I was like you know you've got to rebuild your email list and I think that in two years time we can do a pre-sale on EDC and we can sell without spending any money we can sell like 20,000 tickets just wow. by sending out an email and, uh, you know, and I think that, and that was on a proposal that I put in. And then, you know, once I got into Insomniac, I was like, you know, you guys are doing, you know, at the time, I think it was like 12, 15 major festivals a year. And one of the things they were legendary for was, as they were called Insomniac, was pulling all nighters. And, and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm a grown up and I'm like, all nighters don't make any sense. Like if you do your job <laughs> right and, and, and I was like, you know, you're doing this because you're not planning. And you know that Nocturnal Wonderland is going to be in March. And you know that Beyond Wonderland is going to be in September. And EDC Vegas is going to be in May. And this is going to happen for the next five years. And so why, you know, aren't we backing a timeline up from there and creating a plan and sticking to it and running with it? And so, you know... That was probably one of the first things I did going in there was 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 getting really disciplined with that. The other one was absolutely making a priority to rebuild the email list. Over the course of the two and a half years I was there, we kind of grew it six, seven X and then using the email list properly to 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 market and sell. The other side of it was I'm a huge believer in content as a marketing tool and you, you you know your marketing is your content and your content is your marketing and um at the time they kind of had a bit of a, a a line down the middle of the room where like the content wasn't really for marketing it was like they were doing these insanely beautiful after movies for all of you know their brilliant shows but no one was sitting there going well you know we're spending tens of thousands of dollars on this stuff but we should you know, purpose them specifically for our marketing campaigns. And so mm. we really, really dived into getting really good at planning out content. And then specifically for that EDC, which was EDC 2020, which was on sale in 2019. Uh, I mean, we had, you know, over the course of the two years that I was there, we had 30% year over year growth on 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 the festivals we we came up with some really great new marketing tactics we um were very cognizant of not relying solely on spending on media to drive ticket sales using the content to kind of drive natural um, engagement and then specifically for the, for that EDC we obviously still did spend a lot of money on Facebook advertising across the business. So we were pretty tight with Facebook and we, it was right when they were launching stories mm -hmm. and uh, Facebook came to us and said, we'd like you to be one of our partners for, for the launch of stories with EDC Vegas, which was the 2019 show. And what that meant was that basically they opened up the pipe, you know, as you know, Facebook, through the algorithm and everything, you just because you've got four and a half million followers doesn't mean you ever reach them unless you're paying to reach them. And and mm. we were kind of in that cycle of as that was tightening, um, you know, and it was a frustration. So one of the things we did, we went into that show with a very very specific content plan. I mean, you have to understand we 
our content team for this show, the budget was close to half a million dollars just for videographers, photographers, editors, all that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, doing an episode, a one hour episode of a TV show, you know, major, mm. uh, a major TV show. So rather than like going, oh, we're going to spend this money and just you know, send out a bunch of camera guys like, you know, monkeys with typewriters and see if we get Shakespeare at the end of it. Um, <laughs> We went in with, you know, a very specific plan. And, and and it wasn't that we weren't doing that for the other shows, but we really got, you know, tight with it. And because we knew that we had this pipe with Facebook with the stories. And basically, we went out and during the show, Facebook, you know, reached out to us a couple of times, like, you've broken our servers. Like, the wow. engagement was was just insane across Instagram, across the Facebook stories. And we were trending worldwide and we came off and and we had had the idea prior to the show, like, why don't we, now we've got this very robust email list, why don't we do a pre-sale post-show? There was some back and forth as to like, when do we do it? And we came to the decision to do it. I think it was like the Monday after the week after the show. And we went on sale with a pre-sale and we spent... I want to say we spent $10,000 on paid media and mm-hmm. we did an email blast and we sold 60,000 tickets. Wow. And wow. and it was like wow. So we, you know, we banked at that point I think we left the tickets on sale for a couple of weeks and then we took them off. So we went into the on sale with 60,000 tickets banked and then the on sale was later in September and you know, one of the things we did also was we kind of tightened up our launch program for EDC Vegas tickets. And and again, we had brilliant content. We created a lot of FOMO reigniting the content. We maybe spent 20K, 30K on paid media, whereas in prior years, they'd gone on sale with, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of paid media. Mm. And um, within... I think 14 hours, we sold out, which was 165,000 tickets. So we sold 105,000 tickets, three-day passes on that day. There was a two-year plan to it, including, right. you know, building up the email list and figuring out, you know, having a very tight, aggressive content plan, uh, working with, you know, really talented producers and creators. And it worked. I want to talk to you about that mailing list, but before we get to that, just quickly on the content side of things, you mentioned you had the content plan and obviously you you rejigged it very successfully. What were the key elements of that content? Like what was the content you were making that was resonating so strongly? Well, you've got a guy, Pasquale Rotella, who is, you know, pardon my French, a fucking visionary, um, you know, an amazing auteur and in EDC, which is his crown prince, as it were, You've got one of the most spectacular looking festivals, period. Nothing looks Mm. like it. You've got nine stages. It's a two mile piece of land that is on. And everywhere you look, something amazing is happening. So we had this amazing canvas to start with. You know, being able to capture that, capture the energy of it and sharing it with the world as we, you know, as we plan to during the show. And making and and it wasn't that we hadn't done it the prior year. We did it the prior year as well in 2018. It was also part of the plan. But we we had just gotten really good at it, and um, right, it it just looked spectacular. It was just like holy shit, I want to go to this. You know, if you breathed and danced and you lived on this planet, I'm pretty sure we reached you, and you <laughs> and we created FOMO and aspiration for it. So you were really um, highlighting the experience as a whole, as opposed to yes, zeroing yeah, in on yeah. the talent. Um, and does that still hold true today? I think, you know, for EDC in particular, the talent is something that's assumed that you're going to have the best DJs in the world. We never even released the lineup until, you know, as close to the show as possible. Um, Mm. And it was always, you know, we always came up with some kind of creative way of releasing the lineup. But generally, it wasn't something that necessarily drove the bulk of sales. Um, Unlike, you know, most festivals, it was the experience, it was the brand. 
And and that was again that was a very conscious thing on Pasquale's part. He spent you know many years developing these various brands, and the experiences that you know are definitely different for each one. So it was putting the experience out there was was the real key. And then in terms of growing that mailing list, how did you do that? I mean, there was one really simple one. I I remember, and it was even before I went in there, I kind of been pulled in to um, workshop the on sale for the 2018 edition of EDC. So it was like September of 2017. And I was kind of like walking through the ticketing experience and there was a box, you know, for do you want to receive emails for, from us? And, and it was unchecked. And I was like, why is this unchecked? And, and the guy who was the head of marketing at the time, oh, I think it's something legal in Canada. And, you know, and I was like, well, can we get to the bottom of this? Because first of all, how many tickets do you sell in Canada? And, and you know, that wasn't a big number. And right. secondly, you've heard of this, you know, I said, you've heard of this thing called geofencing, right? So my advice is to have it clicked to opt in and then they have to unclick it to opt out. So that was kind of first very basic e-com 101 um, that, you know, probably over the course of the next three months got us 100,000 names. I mean, you got a business that at the time was selling a million plus tickets a year. So yeah. not to have that opt-in clicked was pretty basic. And then, you know, it was just being aggressive with, you know, making sure as, you know, we, we were managing the, the input of, of all of the ticket purchasers, obviously managing the segmentation of where we got them. And then also the other thing, um, we, we were using, well, they were using Salesforce marketing as the ESP at the time, which... Um, I think was just a legacy of of the fact that they were part of Live Nation. And it's a horrendous tool to use. I'm sure it's fine, you know, if you're a bank and whatever, but it it just was really clunky. And we started using a platform called Hive.co. And Mm -hmm. Hive had been developed um, initially as a contesting tool for music. And then it turned into an ESP. And so one of the things that we we leaned into when we started using it was the contesting. So we did a lot of contesting and sweepstakes, obviously with prizes that were relevant to people that we would want to Mm. come to our festivals and, and, and to get people in at that top of funnel. And is contesting still something? I mean, when you, when you think about imagine music festival, which you're, yeah, I mean, this year we, we, we've done a lot of contesting and, and it's been, really successful i you know i don't quote me but i i i think we probably in the course of this year's campaign we've added ten thousand names to our email list through contesting and and what kind of contesting resonates with that audience you know we're giving away mostly just stuff like you know vip experience for two or you know platinum vip experience you know a, a couple of things we'll do where it's stuff you can't buy, you know, side stage experience, those kind of things. Mm. Nothing that's costing us anything because it's obviously, you know, just experiences as part of the festival. What, what's your approach to email marketing for uh, Imagine Music Festival? In, like if you think about the life cycle of announcing pre-sale, then going on sale and then up to the event and then post-event, how do you structure your email marketing around those landmarks? So if we're starting, if we're looking at like this year's campaign, um, we knew that pretty much on the Sunday night of last year's show, we were going on sale with a blind pre-sale for this year. One of my kind of tactics that I brought into them was we, we did bring in a really good media team and we created amazing content on site. And it was at their new venue, Kingston Downs, which is just a spectacular greenfield woodland site and we you know we had our theme which was like you know welcome to your new home we did a friday saturday and sunday night recap video we had a very aggressive kind of strategy of putting out i think we did four or five reels a day i think you know every hour that we were putting out reels and stories um ton of photo carousels and we really like 
pushed it out there during the show last year to create FOMO and, and really showcase what this festival had become. And then immediately went on with a very attractively priced pre-sale that we ran. And, and we did great. Like we outperformed prior years on the pre-sale pretty much instantly and, and, and you know, generated a significant amount of revenue. Um, the other great thing, in my opinion, is, you know, the earlier you can sell tickets and the more tickets that you can sell early, uh, the more hand raisers and partners that you have to promote your show for the, for the cycle of, of the campaign. I think that those people as hand raisers are super valuable. How do you nurture that? How do you nurture those people and, and try to get them to become spokespeople? I've been using a platform called Social Ladder since when I was back at Insomniac. I've worked with the team over there. I, I think it's a great platform to manage, you know, what we call an ambassador program where as early as possible, those ticket holders, um, we get them in to and we incentivize them to help sell tickets to their friends and, and to mm. their network. You know, typically with social ladder, you build out a reward structure where, you know, you get points for posting, you know, reposting social posts, you get points for sharing your ticket links, and obviously you get um, points for however many tickets you sell. And those rewards are translated to kind of experiences that you can't buy. And there's a right. leaderboard and, you know, there's some stuff that is based on where you position on the leaderboard and there's some stuff that's based on like, you know, how many points you get. Gotcha. And then once you, so you went on sale pretty much straight after the event, you went on sale for the next year's event uh, or, or the pre-sale. How long do you leave that on for? Is, is there a, a We never of went off sale. Um, okay. I, I see no reason, you know, why, why wouldn't I have tickets on sale all the time? Like, mm -hmm. why would I stop someone from buying a ticket to my festival at any point? It honestly doesn't make sense where, you know, I see promoters go, oh, we got a pre-sale. Now we're off sale. I'm going to be off sale for four or five months or mm. until we've got our lineup or something like that. I I really believe that it it has to be a year round process. It It makes no sense to invest in putting up posts, sharing content, generating content and not having a link to someone to go buy what you're selling. What's the point? Sure. Right? How do you um, a maintain interest over that? What what is essentially a year long cycle, but b also avoid ad blindness. Well, I think I think there's you know there, there's a reality that we we understand. It's like we're going to get a lot of interest within a month of the event when we do the pre sale. We have FOMO that we can capitalize on, and then we make it. Uh, really attractive proposition based on price or a payment plan or a combination thereof to get people to buy tickets. And then we're realists. We're probably not going to sell that many tickets from middle of October until we announce, you know, we would do, that's our, you know, that's kind of our blind pre-sale. Then we kind of do like a, a pre-sale, which would be like actually announcing the dates and the venue which will mm -hmm. probably come, you know, some point in January. This is based on, you know, a September through September campaign. And then um, we would see a little spike. We'd, you know, be marketing maybe a price hike here, a tier jump, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, not going into those aggressively. And then with a view, we're going into, our, you know, quote unquote on sale with lineup. And our line, you know, state phase one lineup of announced. And, and this is, you know, what we did for Imagine. And then, you know, we'd come out with the lineup. We would expect to, you know, have a pretty good spike and a good bump with that lineup. And then, you know, we go into the campaign. But again, I know that if I got a festival in September, probably I got my phase one lineup in, you know, I think it was March. We do a push, we keep it going. We have a phase two lineup because we're radius around Bonnaroo. Mm -hmm. We typically kind of have our phase two lineup the week after Bonnaroo. And then um, we figure July is going to be a shitty month. It's kind of like the summer doldrums. And then, you know, we go pedal to the metal. It's coming. 
here, you know, here's right. the show. Look what you're missing. Don't miss out, and you know, run it through to the show time where we are today, uh, for September. Gotcha. And you mentioned price tiers, which I guess are one way of creating urgency. Um, are there any other techniques that that you use to create that sense of urgency? I mean, the only, I, you know, let's be real. The only thing that creates urgency is telling people the price is going up, or, or telling them that you know the current price tickets are running out. You know, which is the same thing. You know, it's rare that you have a festival where you're going to be, you know, four, six weeks out and you can sit there and say, we're going to be sold out. Those are few and far between. And, you know, also coming out of Insomniac, you know, one of the things that we came to the conclusion of is that there's no such thing as a sellout unless there really, really, really is. You're going to find a way to sell, keep selling tickets, even, you know, when supposedly you've sold out. Um, it makes no sense right. not to sell as many tickets and then figure out how to put them in there. And then in terms with Imagine being a multi-day event, beyond um, there being you know a, a price differentiation for buying all three days, presumably there's some sort of discount with that. Are there other ways that, that you find really effective in terms of marketing t- tickets to the entire event? So buy tickets to every se- every single day. I mean, the first thing is that we don't make single day mm-hmm. tickets available until very late in the campaign. It, it, it's like, it's a three day ticket. The The thing with Imagine is it's a camping festival. So it's an hour and a half outside of, out of Atlanta. So, you know, it's in the woods. There's not really many hotels, the towns around there, you know, kind of the, the accommodation is minimal. So it's assumed that, people are going to camp and come for three days. The single day ticket breakout is pretty minimal. We make it more attractive to buy a three day ticket than it is to buy a, you know, one or two single day tickets. So, you know, I think that's a pricing thing. It's not that we consciously are trying to sell three day tickets. It's just like, that's really the thing that makes sense for it. You know, I worked on a festival last year called Wonderfront, which was a multi-day festival in San Diego on the waterfront. So, you know, it was urban, big population locally. It was three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, everything from rock to to rap to, to electronic. I got pulled in probably about two, three months after the on sale. And the crazy thing to me was like they'd gone on sale with their daily lineups, with their with single day tickets, with two day tickets, and with three day tickets, and I was like, "What are you thinking?" It, it made no sense. What you know, because the other parts of of our marketing campaign that we lean into are obviously like, "There's the lineup." You know, you sell tickets without a lineup. You sell tickets with now the venue and the date. You then add a lineup. Then you've got your like line up by stage, you've got your line up by day, then you've got your line up by stage by day. These are all marketing tent poles and you know we need as many of those as possible. So when you launch a festival with a line up, with a daily line up and all this kind of stuff, you you've taken so much powder out of what you're able to do when you market mm. the festival. Absolutely. When you think about add ons and VIP packages as well, I've I've spoken to people who some think that you don't need them uh, when tickets go on sale. Other people think it's absolutely crucial because you can bundle them together at that point when you've got their attention. Where do you sit? Um, I think that we have to have all products that are available for sale on sale when people are coming to your website to buy anything. I also think that we have to be careful on how we build out those ticketing pages so that they're not confusing. So that you know the one the first thing that we want someone to buy is a festival pass. I also know that, you know, we have the opportunity to go back and obviously we've got their email address. So once they bought a ticket, it's very easy to market an add on to them, uh, whether the add on is a camping pass or whatever. We one of the things we did with Imagine was last year for the 22 show, we went on sale and the ticket price included camping not car camping, but included just, you know, a site for your tent. And we made a decision this year not to do that. Obviously our revenue went up on, you know, our overall per head revenue went up. Um, Mm. 
and it didn't really affect it because we actually didn't offer straight camping or we, we offered car camping so you bought a car camping pass for 199 and that enabled four people to share that plot um right you know there's other add-ons like we have pool parties which are add-ons we have early arrival is an add-on thursday pre-party is an add-on obviously upgrades um we did really well this year we've imagined with vip like as a percentage of tickets for some reason vip was was super strong and i think that you know my vip is kind of like you know there's, there's this balance of a price point to get to mm -hmm. where i mean in my mind you want to sell as many vip tickets as possible because it's premium it doesn't really cost a lot to move mm -hmm. the fence where the vips get to hang out you know right. or to add <laughs> some you know a few decent toilets so you absolutely want to get as many people to, to buy VIP as possible. You mentioned not making the ticket buying purchase. You want to make that as simple as possible. You don't want to confuse people. What, what have you found the key ways to, once people are on your site and they're looking at buying, they're looking at converting and they've pressed that they want to buy, what are the, what's the easiest way uh, to actually get them to buy, to reduce any checkout friction? One of the first things that you want to grab when someone is you know, has the intent to buy is their email address. So that when, you know, I'm not saying if, I'm saying when they abandon cart, you have an opportunity to obviously get back to them without paying for it. Again, going back to Insomniac with the, the prior marketing team coming out of being media buyers, when I said, you know, well, how do you deal with abandoned cart? They're like, well, we just, we just shoot some more ads at them. And I was like, but why wouldn't you send them an email? Because it doesn't cost you any money, you know. Right. But anyway, you know, I, I digress. The the <laughs> so I think that you gotta make it as easy as possible to create an account or, you know, go through the checkout process. And obviously, you know, we've got twenty years of best practices in e com that you would hope most ticketing platforms have figured out and believe it or not they haven't and then um like i said just make it quick and easy and simple like have your ga ticket and have your vip ticket at the top of the list of shit that you got to buy and and not then confuse the issue the other thing is obviously the bane of our business is ticketing fees and that difference between you know the 189 dollar ticket and what you actually end up paying for it Again, when I was working on Wonderfront, they had had a very successful on sale from a standpoint of a ton of traffic to the ticketing site. And um, they, they were using a, a, a new platform that will remain nameless that was just incredibly clunky and also had egregious fees on it. And also they had over, they'd overpriced the GA ticket as well. And it got to a point where it was like, I think the ticket face value was like 289, which, you know, even I thought was high because, you know, it was a three day festival and it wasn't Coachella. Like Coachella mm. is essentially a $300 face value. It ends up being like 419 out the door. And, you know, that was a benchmark. We also used to use it Insomniac. Like, you know, if you've got a three day festival, it's got to be cheaper than Coachella. Mm -hmm. um, and Wonderfront was not Coachella, uh, was not nine stages, et cetera, et cetera, with some of the best. And and I was like, the reason that you didn't convert, you had all this traffic, was because people put the tickets in the cart and it was like $415 for a ticket when it they thought they were paying 289 Right. So I guess the short answer is like truth in advertising. <laughs> Like right. don't give them sticker shock when they're checking out. And and which is a challenge because, you know, a lot of the time there's a push and pull between your ticket provider who is, you know, for independent festivals is generally a great supporter of your business. They, you know, underwrite a lot of your business. But in in exchange for that underwriting, they they charge you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that charging is in the fees. So, you know, that's a big part of the push pull. When you're talking about cart, uh, cart abandonment, you use the word what and not if. Is it that prevalent? Do you find that there is more cart abandonment yeah. than not? 
Yeah, I think I think people, particularly further out from from the time of the festival, people are going in and and they're probably building out the package that they want for the the show. Whether it's you know mm. GA tickets, they're camping and everything, and then they're like, oh shit, it's you know five hundred and sixty dollars for me to go to this show. Well, I don't have it right now. Now, I think one of the things that helped with that is payment plans that was something that i feel that we pioneered at insomniac and kind of the industry followed us i think there's a couple of people that might argue with me and there were a couple of people that maybe did do payment plans with ten dollars down before we really went you know full bore at it insomniac so you know having payment plans having low down payments and and you know multiple smaller payments earlier on in the campaign certainly helps helps with cart abandonment again this is ecom 101 it's like people don't always buy they go in and they look but then the beauty of cart abandonment is that you've got that person you've got a direct line to that person you know they have intent and right. you know you can tailor your messaging and your marketing to them to capitalize on that i just quickly wanted to talk to you about uh clanger digital of which you're the CEO and, and you specialize um, in strategy and implementation for revenue and audience growth for live events. Very broad question, but if you were just to highlight two or three key must-dos for event organizers when it comes to growing their audience, what would they be? Your email list is everything. You own it. You own that audience. When you're marketing on you know, Meta, whatever, even if you've got a Facebook page or an Instagram profile that's got tens or hundreds of thousands of, of followers on it. You don't own that. You don't own the access to it. They're running businesses that charge you to reach those people. So building a list that you can directly market to of obviously people who are interested and qualified um, is the absolutely job one. And email, obviously, uh, at nowadays SMS, um, there's some great tools that you can use, particularly for SMS. But to me, that's job one. And and mm -hmm. you can do that with contesting is, is probably the, the quickest, easiest thing. Uh, so that, that would be my first piece of advice. Is it a big gap to the second? Um, my second piece of advice is, is, is just being very clear with knowing who you are, what your brand is. And, and then, therefore, who your audience is and who you're looking to, you know, who your tribe is, as it were, and understanding that and then understanding, like, what is it that will resonate with them? And so it's going to be a content plan around that. And, you know, and it's yeah. as simple as getting the right branding, the right logos, the right fonts for your your marketing materials, your ad mats and stuff like that, like... You know, you're not doing like, you know, a death metal look when you're trying to do, you know, hardcore underground techno heads. Sure. This is basic shit. Um, and, you know, the assumption is that at least the promoters who I have had the pleasure of working with, they, you know, they, they're, they're a little bit ahead of the game on who they think their audience is. But again, you know, I've worked with 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 promoters and being brought in. Usually the problem is I usually get pulled in to rescue something which sucks right. because yeah. I'm, you know, I'm never going to win, right? But, you know, the only way I win is by coming in and, and, and kind of bringing in tactics that then increase sales, which, you know, my, my, my KPIs are really clear, how much revenue I generate and how many tickets we sell. And, right. and, and then, you know, what is the cost of that? You'd be surprised, and I've been surprised by how – promoters don't actually understand their market their audience and everything and getting in there and kind of fixing that is probably actually more difficult than just like figuring out you know the best tactics and strategies and and practices that again are you know really driven by the current strategies in ecom how do you fix it if someone doesn't understand their audience well the first thing that helps is if they're prepared to listen which, you know, I say this quite a lot, you know, most event promoters, their world and their life starts with fuck you. Um, they, 
you know, <laughs> they, they, you know, a lot of the times successful promoters didn't get, you know, to where they are by taking, you know, no for an answer. And, and you know, it's a special breed. But, you know, I, I think it's just sitting there and, and either they're open to listen, whether it's from a point of view of like, you know, they genuinely want to learn or it's desperation. But, you know, it's not, it's also not complicated. Like, you know, if you're building out a festival lineup, that's your first thing. If you if you don't have kind of a brand, you know, if you if you, if your show is going to be driven by the lineup, it's understanding who again who your tribe is, who you're trying to reach, who you want to show up. Like, if you want a bunch of college kids and you know people in their early twenties to show up in a primary market like LA or even a secondary market like San Diego or somewhere like San Francisco, you've got a very specific talent pool to 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 pull from versus, you know, if you want older people who, you know, want to stand around and have an elevated experiences and have a more boutique festival in somewhere like Santa Barbara. Um, mm. So that's, you know, the first part of it. Steve, very last thing, when you think back over your career, have there been any just real pinch me moments for you in terms of whether it was an artist you got to work with or an event or, or a certain success that you had. Is there, was there something, is there one or two things that really spring to mind? Quite a few, but I think the one, you know, that I always, I always get a kick out of telling this story. So on my label moonshine, we had a, an artist named Kiyoki, who was a, a, a big DJ who'd come out of the, the club kid scene in, in New York and he was probably one of our best selling artists. We we did multiple albums with him and sold a lot of records and he started working with Daniel Ash of Love and Rockets. And when I was in high school the summer of I would say like eighty four or eighty five, I think Love and Rockets Seventh Dream of Teenage Heaven was like on repeat in my C D changer in my car, in my C D player in my car and Kiyoki brought Daniel in and Daniel at the time was like really getting into electronic music and dance music. This was kind of mid nineties. And I literally had Daniel Ash sitting across my desk asking <laughs> if he could release music on moonshine. And I was wow. like, you know, if like, you know, 17 year old me, if I told 17 year old me while I was driving around in my Volkswagen golf with seventh tree yeah. teenage heaven on, that this was going to happen, I wouldn't believe it. And, you know, so that, that, that was one for sure. That's great. That's awesome. All right, Steve. Well, look, thank you so much for your time. It's, it's been so great to chat with you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's always fun to, um, you know, get into this. So I'm um, looking forward to checking it out. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs>